please welcome Carnegie Sciences President, Dr. Eric Isaacs. Thank you. So first, I, I wish you all good evening. Uh, I'm Eric Isaacs, as the voice of God just told you. Um, I really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, we run this Capital Science Evening program, but the most special are when we do it in partnership with the Cavalier Foundation. And tonight, we're, I, I think tonight you're in for a real treat with Frank Cessno introducing Connie Ertz about some of the most interesting phenomena in, uh, in STARS. Um, so we're really honored to welcome Cavalier Foundation, who has representation here, to the uh, Norwegian Embassy in the US, who helped organize these, as well as um, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. That's the group that helps organize the prize, the Cavalier Prize, which you'll hear a little bit more about, but it's extremely important prize, very prestigious, and, and Connie's a very deserving uh, recipient of it. So I'm gonna introduce, in a few minutes, I will introduce Frank and Connie. Um, but before we do that, um, because the, the, the president of the Cavalier Foundation, Cynthia Friend, couldn't be here for other reasons, she's going to have a little bit of, uh, so we have a video for her to say a few words. And then uh, also Lisa Uvras, who's um, the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, who couldn't be here. So before we begin, we're going to show a short video from each of them. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Friend, president of the Cavalier Foundation. I joined the foundation in 2021 after a long career at Harvard University in academic research, teaching, and also leadership. It's really a pleasure to now be part of the Kavli Foundation, which was founded in 2000 by our founder, Fred Kavli, a Norwegian-born entrepreneur and businessman. His purpose was to support science for the benefit of humanity, which is truly a lofty goal and vision. Let me first now thank Eric Isaacs, the president of the Carnegie Institute for Science and all of his colleagues for hosting us for this Kavli Prize Laureate Lecture. We at the Kavli Foundation are incredibly grateful for the long partnership we've had with the Carnegie Institute for Science since 2009 to host these Kavli Prize Laureate Lectures. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with you in person tonight because of a previously scheduled commitment in Los Angeles, but I'm looking forward to the next opportunity to get together. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Kavli Foundation. We fund basic research in astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and theoretical physics. And to that end, over the past two decades, the foundation has established 20 Kavli Institutes, 13 of them in the US and seven internationally. In addition, we have been supporting and continue to support impactful science programs in our area. The Kavli Prize is likewise a signature program of our philanthropy. It's designed to honor outstanding scientists and their research accomplishments. The prize highlights the many contributions of science in our world. The Kavli Prize is, in my opinion, unique because it's based on a strong and enduring partnership among the Kavli Foundation, the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters, and the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. They are tremendous partners who elevate the stature of the prize and honor Fred Kavli's Norwegian origins. Now tonight, we're very fortunate to welcome Professor Connie Ertz, one of the Kavli Prize laureates for, in astrophysics in 2022. Professor Ertz will delight you with her incredible research on star oscillations, and I think you'll find her passion for her research to be infectious. I also wanted to note that besides her own scholarly work, Connie's dedicated to developing the next generation of scientists. And to this end, she has recently sponsored a Kavli scholar, Mikita Kleipetz, a refugee scientist from the Ukraine who will continue his scholarly work at Levon University under her direction. Mikita is actually being supported by a new Kavli scholars program that's designed to support exceptional individuals who face disruption to their work in their home country. So thank you, Connie, for bringing this opportunity to the foundation and for being Makita's host and mentor. Finally, I'd like to thank Frank Cessna, who's the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Georgetown University for his extraordinary skills in facilitating these conversations. His partnership is invaluable. Enjoy the conversation this evening, everyone. I look forward to seeing you at the next Carnegie Kavli event.
My name is Lisa Evros, and I'm the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Today, I am in the Fred Kavli Lecture Hall at the Academy in Oslo. It is a great honor for our Academy to team up with the Kavli Foundation, Carnegie Institution for Science, and the Norwegian Embassy for this event where Kavli Prize laureate Connie Arts will give a lecture on star quakes, exoplanets, and extraterrestrial life. Professor Arts received the Kavli Prize in 2022, together with Jürgen Christensen Dalsko and Roger Ulrich for, and I quote the Kavli Prize Committee in Astrophysics, for their pioneering work and leadership in the development of helioseismology and asteroseismology, their research has laid the foundation of solar and stellar structure theory and revolutionized our understanding of the interior of the stars. When the Kavli Prize is awarded in Oslo, we are so privileged that the King Harald V awards the Kavli Prize to the laureates. For each of the three Kavli Prizes, astrophysics, nanoscience and neuroscience, a prize committee is appointed by our academy. Members of the committees are world leading scientists within their fields. The committee members are chosen by the Royal Society in London, the French Academy of Sciences, the Max Planck Society, the National Academy of Sciences in the US and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The high reputation of the Kavli Prize is due to the solid work by the prize committees. Arts is not only an outstanding scientist, she has also guided numerous PhD students and postdocs from more than 15 nationalities, creating a unique team spirit and personal touch in her supervision. She says that she's proud of her former team members becoming fabulous STEM teachers, inspiring and educating the next generation on a daily basis. I concur with Connie Ertz when she says that it is extremely awarding that the Kavli Prize acknowledges such a human approach in academia. I could not agree more. Warm greetings from Oslo. So thanks to both Cynthia and uh, Lisa for their great comments. Um, I now have the privilege of just saying a few words to introduce both of our speaker and our interviewer here tonight. Um, and as I said, you're going to hear a great story. You've heard that from Cynthia as well. I, by the way, was fortunate enough in 2022 to go to Oslo. My first trip to Oslo I was invited by Cynthia to go to the, the prize. And it was a really remarkable event. And, and Connie was there and she gave some really amazing remarks. So I'm, that's why I'm confident it's going to be great tonight. I just, I don't want to get too much into the science, but I can't resist being a physicist. What Connie, Connie has done is really remarkable and um, it, really remarkable. And, you know, if you think about what a star is, a star is just a blob of gas. It's a sphere of gas. Of course, it's burning. There's fusion. There's a lot of stuff going on. There are many layers to a star, mostly hydrogen, helium, and some other elements in a star. Um, and for many years, of course, astrophysicists have been, th it's irresistible for astrophysicists to think about stars. Because these things, being gas balls, they must do interesting things, like they must vibrate, they must breathe, they must do all kinds of things, but it was all speculation. What Connie was able to do was to be really the first team, her, she and her team, to start measuring what those oscillations looked like. It was actually like a breathing mode. And the important thing about what she observed was these stars, and she calls it stars quakes, so that was the name they had developed, like, like the earth, they're very much like the earth. They're like, the earth is layered, there's earthquakes, there's volcanic activity on stars, there's star quakes. And there is similar to, to volcanic activity, there are so flares, there are all kinds of things. And these kinds of disturbances can launch these waves, just like the earth. And if you look, in fact, at Carnegie, we do a lot of basic geophysics and we use earthquakes to study the core of the earth. They actually an earthquake will create a, a blast of sound. The sound will go through the core of the earth and we'll be able to measure things about properties about the earth. What not, Connie has done is nothing less than do the same thing on stars, but learned a lot more about what star, how stars function. A really remarkable way, a real, this is a real observational physicist or astrophysicist to think about how do you use, it's not just knowing that they're there, they're there. How do you use them to study the, the stars? And so what she has done 
almost singularly, but now there's a lot of people trying to do it, I, I would imagine. She's really measured, she's used these star quakes to measure what the stars are made of, what they look like in the core, what the densities are. So that's all I'm gonna say about the physics. She'll say a lot more, I'm sure, when she gets there. But but it, to me, it's like, it's so cool being a physicist that, that you can do this now because Connie was the one who who made it happen. Um, so, um, so I would also say just a few things about Connie. She's, you know, she's done amazing stuff in her field. She's a member of the Royal Academy for Science and Arts and, and, uh, of Belgium and the Arts of Belgium, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and the European Astronomical Society. So she's she's done this and that's not all. There's a lot of other things I can't go through. She has a PhD uh, from where you are now, right? So you went back to your home institution uh, in Leuven um, where uh, she was an undergraduate in mathematics and, and then she and mathematics from Antwerp. So this, this program that you're gonna hear tonight is really uh, about her science, but she's, as you heard from from both Lisa and from, from Cynthia. She's a remarkable human being as well. Uh, I do also wanna say a few words about the interviewer here, Frank, Frank Sesno. Frank is a really remarkable person. We've been working with Frank for a long time at Carnegie and the Carnegie Cavalry. He's one of the most remarkable interviewers. You'll have to decide for yourself. I don't wanna over, overstate it, but, but he's currently a director of strategic initiatives at GW, George Washington, slight correction, I think, from what was said in the video, uh, and creator of Planet Forward, a user-driven web and television project that highlights innovations and sustainability. Really creative man. And he's, he's at GW creating new programs to help students, even non-scientists, understand what, what it is to communicate science, what it is to, how do you understand science, not just science, but everything, right? How, how do you be a good journalist? We want all of the students to be good journalists. So, so we're very excited to have have Frank here uh, as well, and you'll you'll see how great it is. He was also at CNN, uh, White House correspondent and an anchor. So he's been on TV. He's been at Cavalier lectures. He's been in, in everything. So with that, uh, I know this will be fascinating. And what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Frank and Connie for their for their discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of you who are joining us here, and thank you to those of you who are joining us via live stream uh, now or in the future, and thank you to Connie for being here. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you to have me. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get to the U.S. for this? Uh, on Monday. I arrived on Monday. And how have you occupied your time since then? Uh, sunny Washington is so much better jogging on the mall than rainy Belgium. For <laughs> <laughs> jogging on the mall. We'll have to yes. watch for that. Um, so we're gonna do a few things this evening and some of them are a little bit different. So if you haven't already uh, gone on and gotten on pigeonhole where we're gonna be doing these polls and other things, please do that. And we'll have some further instructions for you in a minute. We are gonna start a little bit differently tonight. We talked about that, right? Yeah. Because do the stars are, do you look at the stars to measure their oscillations? Sure, we do look at the stars. you listen to the stars? Of course. And it's music to your ears? Yes, it is. Sort of a star-based concert? Yes, symphonies. A symphony. From the cosmos. So shall we start with a little music? Yes, please. Okay, so we're going to do that tonight. Um, and this is going to be your first poll question. So I'm going to put this up as we do this. You're going to hear um, two instruments now. Instrument number one, instrument number two. And we're going to ask you, which do you think is physically larger? So let's start with instrument number one. Instrument number two. Would you like to hear that again? <laughs> okay, In let's, let's hear it one more time. Which is the larger, the physically larger, and you can vote on your phones. If you go to pigeonhole.at slash starquake, you'll see the poll question number one there. Instrument number one. Remember that, and we'll listen again to instrument number two while you're voting. Okay, while I wait for results here, Connie, why did we do that? Well, we just have been listening to sound waves, and anybody in the audience has experienced that before, I think. So all my students always have to work in my classes. So you're my students tonight. <laughs> okay. and you have to work whether you like it or not. Uh, all right. So, and we have, and I'm going to tell you our, our results. Yeah. Some of you may be able to see the results on your phones as well. 
about 74.7, 75.3. So three quarters of the people in the room said instrument number one is physically larger. Uh-huh. 25.9% say instrument number two is larger. Okay. All right. All right. Who's right? I have a clever audience because the first group is right. The first group is right. So, right. And we could actually invite, should we invite Karsten to come down? Yes, please. Karsten, our, our musician, will join you now. <laughs> Um, thank Karsten for playing his symphony deck. And you can see his two instruments. Thank you, Karsten. <laughs> <laughs> and let us hear just a little bit from the larger instrument. Thank you, Karsten. <laughs> All right. So, so Connie, um, discuss how we go from music here on Earth to the music in the stars and how that corresponds to what you do. Yes, so sound waves, you know, take some time to travel through musical instruments. And the bigger the instruments, the longer it takes, right? And so from the tone of the sound waves, we can decide what's the bigger instrument and what's the smaller one. And for me, stars are just three-dimensional spherical instruments. And uh, you can literally detect by listening to the music of the stars, the, the starks, the seismic waves and activities? Yes, so the, the star quakes create sound waves that travel through the star. Huh? And this is very similar, as Eric was already uh, mentioning, that uh, it's very similar to earthquakes creating waves that travel through our planet and probe the physics and the chemistry of our planet. So we do the same, but then for stars. And since like uh, a bit more than a decade now, we can actually measure the star quakes as you see on the slide here. So you can, you can, here. You can measure yeah. what it looks like. Yeah, you see the seismic on, activity. How you know? did you get into this? Why star quakes? Oh, that's beautiful mathematical physics. And so we had uh, developed theories for that. We just didn't have data to couple the observations to the theory. And so for that, we needed uh, instruments on space missions, right? Has anybody, have you ever heard a starquake? <laughs> okay, you wanna hear a starquake? All right, here's one. This is, tell us what we're about to hear. Yeah, so I'm gonna place you now into the center of the sun. The sun has sunquakes and you're gonna hear the sound waves created by the sun quakes, except that your human ear is not really sensitive. So we do the, a global shift so that you can hear it. But so are you ready for your first cosmic symphony? This is what you would hear if you were in the center of the sun listening to sun quakes. <laughs> You like that? <laughs> so what are we hearing? So we're hearing the symphony of the sun, really. So the sun has, uh, you know, sunquakes, yeah? making the gas of the sun going up and down with a periodicity typically of five minutes. So, you know, the sun has a certain size. We know it perfectly huh? because we can measure it. And so the sound waves have a certain frequency, a certain tone, right? So let's pretend that the sun is one of these flutes that we just heard, you know? And then we can wonder like, okay, the sun will grow up, will get old, it will be about to die, no worries, not tomorrow, in uh, a long time okay from now. now. Yeah. But what will happen is that as stars grow older, you know, they, they become much bigger. You know. As stars grow older, they become bigger. So we have the red giant. They Another really big, okay. really, really, really big. And how big is this? 10 to 100 times the size of the sun right now. And here's what this sounds like. Belgian discos love this. <laughs> when we came out with this uh, result. So, and okay. here's, here we come to the musical instrument, right? Yes. The larger instrument has this deeper, bolder sound. Bigger, 
bigger instruments, so the waves takes, take longer right. to cross it, the sound waves. It takes longer. That means that the frequency is lower. The tone of the music is lower. So now you know that uh, by measuring the frequencies of the sound waves, we immediately know how big the star is. So we have one more instrument to add here, the cosmic piccolo. Was that a piccolo you were playing? Okay, well, if you're <laughs> far, far away. Yeah. What are we hearing there? This is a small star that actually has somehow lost its envelope and has become smaller, but it is full of helium. Well, the sun is dominantly uh, having hydrogen and helium and a little bit more of uh, other material. But so this star is smaller, hence the frequency of its sound waves is higher. And right? what does this tell us? So this, this is what you map and you can, you can bring tremendous knowledge about the star. Exactly. Its age, its size, yes. and how it relates to yeah. uh, other planets, exoplanets, galaxies, right? So explain that. What does this tell us? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the star quakes and the waves that they create, they inform us about the uh, internal structure of the stars, we call it. What is that? It's the density, mainly the temperature also, um, you know, Above all, also how the gas is rotating around. And so we cannot get information on that directly, except via the waves that are created by the star quake. And you can, you can date a star. That's right. Why? Because, you know, if you have, uh, like the sun is currently transforming hydrogen into helium, and it's creating a tiny little helium ball compared to its total size. Right? But sound waves, when they propagate, they feel that they're hitting a helium ball, right? And so their frequencies tell us how big this inner helium ball is. And that is directly related to how old the sun is because it has been transferring hydrogen into helium throughout its life. So the longer you wait, the bigger this uh, helium gas ball sits inside the sun. And so by measuring the frequencies, we know how big this helium ball is. And that translates to the age. So, of the so how old were those stars that we just listened to? Oh, well, like the sun is typically like 4.6 uh, billion years, right? Billion. Yeah. But then when, when we listen to these cosmic bars, yeah, that's typically like to, uh, at least twice as old, right? And so, you know, 10 billion years, more or less. While the, the small piccolo, well, that's a special case because it has lost its material somehow. So that age is like uh, a bit different to estimate. But anyway, we can make a timeline. And that's important because the sun has planets and we live on one of them. And so the only way to age date stars with planets is via star quakes. And that's the only way to get ages of exoplanets, actually. We'll talk about exoplanets and what that yes. means too. But I know that there's a particular star that you've been focusing on for more yeah. than two decades. Yeah. Tell us about that. Oh, yes. I called it my star, but nobody owns the universe. Uh, so nobody <laughs> owns the stars. But I have a special relationship with one star. It has a telephone number called AG129929. Why is it special? Because it special? I was, the uh, uh, well, it gave me star quakes. And for the first time, it allowed me to derive the way the gas rotates close to its helium core. And that was the first star other than the sun for which we could derive this. Is that your aha moment? I always love asking yeah. scientists, what's your aha moment? Yeah, that was the aha moment. I was at home in the Christmas break with my daughter. It's actually literally 20 years ago now. It was 2003. And what happened? And so I, I was analyzing the data and we had been trying that star for 20 years, you know. And so we just couldn't understand it. And then all of a sudden I saw the frequencies of its six quakes. And I knew, oh, this is going to tell me how the gas is literally rotating around. And so that was my aha moment. <laughs> yeah. So um, these, these rotations that you can map, mm -hmm. right, that help you date the stars, yeah. it helps you size the star, all this kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What is the relevance of that rotate? I mean, what do you study? 
Yeah, why is it so important right. to, to know the in, inner rotation right. of a star, right? Because when you, um, when you rotate a fluid or a gas, then you mix the chemical elements. And that brings extra fuel to the heart of the star where nuclear fusion is going on. So the more you mix, the longer the star can live. I mean, that's really the life of the star. Yeah, that's the lifetime of the star. And that, and it's a rote, you're studying, among other things, the rotation, right? Exactly. So yeah. let's do a poll here. Let's, this yeah. is kind of fun that we want to ask you. <laughs> if I can get yeah. this to advance. There we go. And this will be on your phones if you go to pigeonhole, right? We know the rotation period of the Earth is a day. Right? Well, what about the rotation period of our sun? Is it an hour, a day, about a month, or about a year? So you put that in. I get to go to my iPad here because I see the results mm -hmm. as people are doing this. And I should say, by the way, that we ask questions on the way in. And I have to check that because we ask people what their relationship to science is. And I want to see what those results are. Okay, so if I go back here, Rotation of the Earth is a one day. What about the rotation? So about right now, we're at about 16% of you say about an hour. About 9% of you say about a day. About 43.2% of you say about a month. And 32 say about a year. So 31 say a year. 40, 44 say a month. 7.6 say a day. 16% an hour. And the answer is? Isn't it amazing? It's our host star. And we have distributed voices, right? So it's about a month, right? About a month. So good, about 40, the votes are changing as I speak. That's, that's an amazing thing. We don't need election reform here. Yeah. Uh, so what does that tell you and us about our son? Yeah, so our son takes about one month to revolve around this rotation axis. Now, for us astrophysicists, that's a slowly rotating star. So it means that the material inside the sun isn't mixing very efficiently, right? You have some stars that rotate around, in, not in a month, but really in a day, right? These big, bigger stars rotate faster, and they mix much more fiercely. So that's important, to, again, to age date the star. And so for the sun, we actually know the age of the sun. We know that from other means completely independently, like meteorites, right? And so we know that age dating the sun from its sunquakes is very, very precise if we compare it to other means. So uh, in doing this rotation estimate, we can really uh, age date stars very well. And that is new since... Uh, Asteroids as well. It's, 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 an, it's very new and it's amazing. And as Eric was saying, it's an incredible breakthrough. You like to say stars rule. Yes. I think clearly course. they do. Yes. And it's worth observing and, and yeah. kind of reinforcing here that through your study in the starquakes, this allows us to date the stars to um, help then determine the age of exoplanets and these relationships around it. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so here you see like stars get born in, in uh, interstellar uh, star forming nebula. And then depending on the amount of matter that they get at birth, they can either live a quiet life like our sun, like luckily for us, huh? it's very quiet, a little boring star, uh, one could say, right? Good. Uh, it will slowly die out and become a big ball of diamonds in the end after about 10 billion years. But you also have stars that are born with way more, more gas. And so these go to the other side of this diagram. They, leave, they, they lead a, a violent life, a very fast life, and they will explode. And what does that mean? Uh, you say a violent, a fast life. What's... What's happening? And yeah. you can see this when you measure it, right? Yeah, they, they have winds and they they lose matter. They expel it uh, during their whole life, basically. And then they explode. So you really have different types of stars. Huh? You have the big blue stars that you see here. Uh, they live uh, very briefly. And briefly, in uh, uh, astrophysical terms, is millions of years. And they make all the matter in the universe. They're the steel factories of the universe. And then you have like tiny little stars on the, on the other side here. They're still in their childhood because they live like uh, really billions and billions of years, many more 
than the universe is old. So they are still in their first generation. And so in order to understand how the chemistry of the universe is evolving, we have to know how many of these big ones there are and how many of the small ones. We have to age date them, we have to size them appropriately, etc. And so that's where star quakes What are. I find, yeah. I mean, I find so many things fascinating about your work <laughs> and thank you for it because yeah. it, it, it turns a light on in many ways, but there's a direct connection between your study of these star quakes and the search for extraterrestrial life. What is that? Yes, so, you know, we know about exoplanets uh, uh, nowadays, but what we would want to know is how can life originate on which planets? And so in order to know how old planets are, we really have to know how old the host star is. And so you can only do that properly from star quakes. So that brings us to our next polling question, which we turn to you about. So thinking about <laughs> life, where would you prefer to have your second home? on a planet orbiting a young, big blue star, on a planet ordering, orbiting a middle-aged, small orange star, or on a planet orbiting a dying red giant star. That doesn't sound very appealing, but maybe there's a surprise here. Yeah. So if you go on to your pigeonhole and your phones, and I'll come back here and look and see how you're doing. Do you have a second home yet, uh, Connie, on one of these? I have my favorite, but I will <laughs> okay. wait for the poll. All right. So what people are saying as we speak, uh, oop, I'm going to the wrong one here. Uh, about 9% of you would like to be on a planet orbiting a young, big blue star. About 90% of you would like to be on a planet orbiting a middle-aged, small orange star. And only 2% of you would like to be on a planet orbiting a dying red giant. Doesn't sound very appealing. No, I understand. Where would you like your second home? I would also be in the second bullet, you know, on a planet orbiting a middle-aged, quiet, small star like the sun. And you're looking for that, right? Yes, of course, we're looking so for that. So tell us what you're finding. Oh, we find uh, lots of planets around a variety of stars but not so much around these big blue young stars because they, they are expelling their matter. And so that's not easy for planets to stick around. So they don't have uh, planets around them. And then of course the red dying, red giants, yeah, it becomes hundred times bigger. So what's the sun gonna do? It's gonna eat us, right? When it starts to die. So we don't wanna be in that phase. You don't have to be worried about that, uh, by the way. You have plenty of time. <laughs> Even your grandkids, don't worry about it. Uh, that's really billions of years. But so you want to be finding, looking for life around a star that is a copy of the sun, ideally. And you want to look at a planet that's a copy of the Earth. Because the circumstances might just be right there to have life. Because we have at least one successful experiment. Do you believe there are other successful experiments out there? I think it's hard to avoid uh, almost because there are like billions of stars and there are billions of galaxies with billions of stars. Have you seen so, any evidence? No, we one? haven't. You need to give us a little bit more time, you know. How much time do we need to give you? Uh, <laughs> future generations will find it. Future yeah. generations. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I want to ask you some more about how you've gotten here and how you see this stuff. This is fascinating. Um, because what you see and what you hear and what you track connects directly with the technology that we have and the technology mm -hmm. you've used. Yeah. So tell us how you are measuring this and how these different um, incredible you know, um, telescopes yeah. let you see and hear. Yeah, so the, the whole field of astroseismology really only started when we had satellites observing the seismic activity of stars above our atmosphere. Huh? Because you know people tend to say like, oh, stars twinkle. That's, that's not the stars actually, that's the Earth atmosphere that disturbs the stellar light. So you have to be able to put a telescope and an instrument above the Earth atmosphere. And so Kuro, uh, as you see here on the left, uh, was a, a, a French-led European mission that really uh, developed uh, the precursor science, let's say, of both exoplanet searches and star quakes, because these go hand in hand, right? And then we had the, the beautiful uh, NASA Kepler uh, mission that uh, observed like 200,000 stars during a long time, 
you know, with all the seismic activity. And right now, literally, TESS is doing that for us. So I'm very grateful to the- and You've worked with all the, of these. I work with all of them, you know, and Wh they-, which, they, you which, know, which was responsible for your aha moment? Oh, none of them. That was at the time when I was still doing ground-based work. We had to go to our telescope and observe the star night after night. And that's why it took us 20 years. If I do this star now with the satellites, then within a month, I have the result. Within a month? Yes. So this is revolutionary. This, this is revolutionary, yes. So I'm totally grateful to all you taxpayers for <laughs> allowing us to build these space missions. The taxpayers aren't done yet. Yeah. No, 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 because we're building a new machine that you see here. Uh, that's the Plato mission. So the European Space Agency is currently building uh, a platform that hosts 26 telescopes to find, you know, copies of the Earth revolving around copies of the Sun. And so we are in the middle of... of uh, building it literally and uh, we really look forward to this so here you see me in the clean room at uh, isa in uh, northwijk in the netherlands uh, and you see it's real it's not a fiction anymore so uh, i've been working on the design of this mission since its first uh, inception how say. many in the yeah. room have seen the imagery from the james webb telescope and okay so yeah. everybody yes. and it's yes phenomenal right it's just incredible brilliant could you explain what is the what is the leap that this telescope will give to you as you're trying to see and hear these oscillations yeah so so james webb is fantastic of course but it appears very far out in the universe way back in time right um i don't want to use up telescope time from from webb you know why i need a long time series i need years of monitoring and so you don't want to use web for that. Let that to the people who do the far cosmos. What I need is like a, a, a bunch of telescopes, as you see here, that can stare at stars during a long time with a super high precision to measure the seismic activity. And so Plato is really the first mission to do both hunting for exoplanets and the seismology of the host star. And so, so how, what, how, much of, yeah. how much of a change will that make in the kind of work that you do uh, trying to peer inside star yeah that will be revolutionary because it will give us information of more than 20 kepler satellites at the same time so it's two orders of magnitude so, but what does that compare. mean is that just does that accelerate what you're doing now dramatically or does it allow you to see and hear mm -hmm. with much more detail and if so what would we get from Yeah, so, so we haven't really found copies of the Earth in long orbits, like it takes us a year, right, to revolve the sun. And so we really lack a good uh, sample of Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of their host star, because we are obviously in the habitable zone of the sun. Um, and so most of the planets that we have, we have thousands of them, are not really in that perfect circumstance where life could originate. So that's what really Plato is made for. What, what do you want to find with this and in your career? What we want to find, uh, we want to find extraterrestrial life, right? And in order to find that, we need a big samples of stars with star quakes and with uh, planets in the right position compared to their host star so that they revolve around their star just as we do it, but in an area or in a, at a distance where liquid water can occur. Because we associate life as we know it, which is like only one experiment, right? We, we need optimal circumstances and we need the circumstances to be good during a long, long time. That's what biologists think happens to create us, you know? And so, right. yeah. so hundreds we, of millions of years. Uh, hundreds of millions of years. So the, the star cannot only live a few million years because it will not be long enough. And the star can also not be too big because then it's, it's too, it eats its planets. And then it's not a good circle, not a nice second home. Do you, you watch? Know? Do you watch like science fiction and 
well, Star Trek and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I can watch it, but <laughs> I, I prefer to watch the real, the reality of I, my story. I was going to say, I mean, I don't know how you watch that after you know this. I don't so think that fiction. I know that you're incredibly proud of your science, but I also know that you're incredibly proud of the young people, yeah. the students, the PhDs, yes. the postdocs yes. that you work with. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because that is a very inspiring thing to hear. Yes. So... I'm a very proud mother, as you can see on this uh, photo. Well, you have a moniker. These are your two children on the right. right? Yes. I, and I'm going to let yeah. you to explain yeah. what your moniker is. Your nickname is? Astro Mama. Astro Mama. And we have a round of applause for Astro Mama. <laughs> yeah. But the reason I think this is so incredible is... What what you try to what what you're doing as an astro mama and with these young people yeah. is you're especially nurturing of young women scientists yes and young people broadly sure are your children scientists well they're not astrophysicists they're not STEM scientists my daughter is a children psychologist right and my son is a a scout of the Belgian national uh, soccer league so. <laughs> Very different uh, backgrounds why, than their parents. Why has, yeah. has being an astro mama and using that term and talking to young people about that, why does that matter to you? Well, it matters because I we we really lack young women in, in STEM fields. And so I can in, hope to inspire them by giving the example like, okay, you can be a mama and an astrophysicist at the same time. I'm not saying it's easy. But it's very well doable if you're passionate about what you're doing. And how do you tell these young women and young people that they can manage their intense scholarship and science and research and their intense demands from family partners and others? It's very simple. Happy people work better. So I make sure that my team is happy. And that's very important for me. I want to see the smiles on their faces on a daily basis and i want to inspire them and that's also why i do a lot of like uh, outreach you know bring science to the people for me that's a very important aspect because it's exciting to you yes it excites me but uh, it inspires the next generations and they are the innovators they are the innovators. what do you right. think what do you think the biggest challenges to this generation of scientists as you see it it's a complicated world yeah, it's a complicated world, but the universe is so beautiful. And so they're, uh, they're really uh, able to learn and they are very strong computationally, much stronger than, you know, my generation was. And what I like a lot, and you see that a little bit uh, on the other, on the photo, is the team spirit that it brings. So for me, uh, my students are really... Uh, also, I'm, I'm doing my job for the stars and for my passion, but also to, to, to educate uh, youngsters and make them feel welcome, but also inspire them to do teamwork. Because for me, that's really important. And, and frankly, this, this prize thing is fantastic, but it's a team prize. It's, we were celebrating uh, at that uh, photo uh, as a team. And that's uh, very important for me because uh, team uh, teams that are, you know, getting along, they work much better. And so that's why I keep saying like happy people really work better. Right? It's, <laughs> it's not a, it's not just some kind of statement. It's reality. So it is when you think about these teams, when you think about these young people, and then you think about the field. Yeah. Starquakes, what you're studying, mm -hmm. Plato telescope that's coming. Where is the field going? What do you tell them that this future is likely to hold for them in the sciences? In, in the sciences, well, um, we're going to revolutionize our knowledge of our galaxy where we live in, right? And um, we need better and better models of stars and, and better computational tools. So I, I train them as uh, general scientists and they uh, help each other so they can have the ambition to do way, way better than me. And that works. If you trigger them, then they start doing that. And so I'm I'm one of these project leaders who gets super excited and proud when my students are so much smarter than I am. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Anna to come down and help me get back to the page here where the questions are, because <laughs> my technology has been left in the dust. Oh, yeah. That's the, our age. Of no, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I yeah. want to go to questions from the audience now, and you can put questions into 
your uh, pigeonhole app there if you've got that on your phones. Um, and you'll see other questions that are there. Here we go. Um, and I get to see, and you get to see how popular some of these are. So um, here's the first question for you as we go to the audience. Does our sun have star quakes? And this, can, can this affect us in any way? Are they like solar flares? So yes, the, the sun has sun quakes. We, we heard the, uh, the sound waves connected to them, but this is something different than solar flares. The sun also has that. So these are eruptions that can be really annoying for our technology driven society. But these are, you know, uh, they come and go. They're sort of mini explosions, right? They're very different from the smooth, soft sun quakes that go uh, and change the brightness of the sun by one in a million only, while the flares are eruptive. Huh? It happens, it's an explosion and it's gone. And so for the life of the sun, these eruptions are not really that important, but it's annoying for us living here on this planet because it can uh, give uh, like uh, disturbances to our computers, et cetera. To our computers, okay, yeah. that's what we need. So <laughs> here's, here's uh, a similar question. Um, what was the greatest challenge you faced in your career and how did you overcome it? Uh, the greatest challenge was that like uh, work-life balance it was not so easy in my generation, right? And um, constantly battling between uh, family life, raising kids and academia, while there are so many things that are unnecessary to do, like, like admin and, and a waste of time that are, for me, energy drainers. I'm hoping to battle that for the next generations, and that's why I work a lot with young women also, to show them that they have to speak up and get rid of uh, time that's <laughs> unnecessary and uh, focus on their passion, and then it is much easier. What do you tell them to get rid of? Um, unnecessary uh, administrative burden and uh, unnecessary discussions about how to organize things. I, I always tell them, just do it your way, even though it's different from all others. Yeah, there's no administrative burden in a university, so there would be no problem with that. Um, <laughs> here's another question. Do starquakes affect the planets that surround them? Are they safe? Uh, the starquakes in general are small enough to not influence too much of what's happening in the surroundings, unless the planet is very close to the star. And so then you have tidal interactions like you know from the Earth-Moon system. For me, tides are forced oscillations actually, uh -huh. right? And so if the two objects are very close, then they interfere with each other. Right. So let's go inside a star for a minute with a uh -huh. question. How can you tell that stars lost helium? Uh -huh. And how can you tell if other stars lost their helium or not? Do you know? And how does that relate to their age? Okay. So, so the material that gets mixed inside, star, first the material has to be created, right? The sun right now is turning in its inner hot region, uh, transforming hydrogen into helium by nuclear fusion, right? So stars are super champions in creating nuclear energy. We humans are lousy in it, right? And so- uh, <laughs> Which may or may not be a good thing. Yeah. Um, so so the, the more material a star can make, uh, uh, the older it is. Because, you know, in order to change one material into another, you need time. And so that's the clock and the waves they feel the chemistry of the environment where they propagate, right? So in that sense, you know, the character of the waves directly couples to the physics and the chemistry yeah. of the, the, the cavity, which is the musical concert hall of the star, you could the say. Musical right? concert hall of the star. Well, yeah. then here's a perfect follow-on question to that. And that is, how do you differentiate the frequencies mm -hmm. you're hearing from the star waves mm -hmm. from other sounds in space? Ah, uh, yes. Well, so, you know, the frequencies of the stars, we, we sort of know what to expect. Just like you, with, you know that too. The flutes, you know, you know the answer, right? Big flute, small flute. And for us, it's the same. Even if there would be noise in this room and there's constant noise, um, our musician here would still be able to play the flute and you would still recognize it. And it's similar. We recognize the sound waves throughout the whole noisy business of the star, right? And that's because it's nicely 
periodic, it has nice tones, as musicians would say, right? It is a symphony, right? And uh, we can that, uh, distill the symphony from the noise. What is the other noise? What is the other noise? The other noise can be eruptions. It can be uh, rotation. It can be uh, bubbling gas bells. That all creates noise, right? But it's not periodic as the waves are strictly nicely periodics. So the frequencies or the tones of the musics tell us what comes from the start wakes and what is all the rest. Right. It's just so fascinating. All right, here's a, here's a question from somebody who we might say is in the business. What is the relationship between theorists, oh, observers, yes. Yes. and experimentalists? Uh -huh. Has that changed in recent years? Do you see it changing in the future? Uh, the relationship is very important for me, and so I am trying to cover all these different aspects, including the, the computer scientists, actually, in these uh, machine learning times, and uh, that's an, an important aspect as well. So, I mean, the observers, of course, need to get the observations to the highest possible precision, and so we need to get the frequencies really as well as we can. And then there's a theorist and they constantly have to adapt their theory because the star quakes open up the star and this gives us some surprises. And so we have an iterative scheme. We need to comp computer models that tell us the predictions of the star quakes. The predictions do not match the observations. The observations then tell us how to improve the theory. And then we go back to better computer models and we run around in this circle and get ever better results up to one in a million precision. That's the task, and we are not yet there. We still have work to do. So that may be some of the future. Yeah, so the observations are way ahead of the theory for the moment. Um, right. Great question, back to your, um, to your telescopes and how uh -huh. you see, listen uh -huh. from the audience. Which system will Plato, will the Plato Space Telescope first observe? Lots of stars and exoplanets out there to choose from. How will you prioritize the field? Oh, so Plato is going to be 20 Kepler fields. So it's an immense field of view. And it's just going to download the, uh, the, the brightness of all these stars in, uh, uh, in the best possible way. So, I mean, we're going to observe like literally millions of stars during two years at a very high But if cadence. you're observing millions yeah. of stars, yeah. how do you know which one to listen to? Oh, but well, their uh, artificial intelligence uh, comes in and the computers, because, you know, we, we're not going to look at the light curves one by one. That would be... So that's, uh, so that's you know, great. So that's, how is AI shaping? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. all, has it already changed your, yes. the way you work? Absolutely. How? Yes. Yes. Because it tells us, uh, you know, I get millions of stars, but I want stars that have star quakes. So we do machine learning and we let the computers... So, like, do you, out you this, walk into the lab one day and, and, yeah. and your robot says, Connie, these check this are one them. out. Yeah, exactly. Seriously? So, yes, I, I'm very serious. So I used to do that by eye, but of course that's uh, fine for a couple of thousand stars, but not for a couple of million stars. Well, and this must be, it's almost incomprehensible how that would accelerate your ability to observe yes. what you need to observe. Sure, yes. The computers do it in a, in a matter of a few seconds. Just as long as the as the seismic activity light curves are of high quality, huh? and so the satellites bring that to us, and then we have all sorts of like clever computer codes to tell us which ones are the most interesting stars. Do you ever feel that this is moving faster than you can keep up with? Yes, but my youngsters take care of that. <laughs> yeah. that, that that's I why, mean, that's, that's that's fantastic. Why you have the team? Yes, <laughs> yes, see. that's why I have your the, own help desk. Yes, uh -huh. Yeah. All right, here's a great question that now has the most votes. Who do you think will find life first, James Webb or Plato? Which, which approach is more efficient? Oh, well, we need them together. See, Plato will tell us where to look. And then satellites like Webb or other satellite missions that are being built uh, at ESA will do remote sensing of the atmospheres of the planets while they move in front of their host star. So we need to actually first have a big sample of where to go and hunt for chemical signatures in the atmosphere, because that's how we think we can envision the search for life to be most effective. So if we bring those things together then, the web 
James Webb Telescope, Plato, as you're talking about it, mm -hmm. AI that you've now mm -hmm. mentioned that's so accelerating this. What is a reasonable hunch for how quickly we might be able to find at least a candidate, a, a credible candidate for extraterrestrial? When I give public talks or go to schools to talk with uh, uh, secondary school students, I'm telling them that they're going to find it. Really? Yes, of course. I might be a bit uh, too late and be in retirement, but this is I going. I don't think you're ever going to be in retirement. No, I yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but seriously, yeah, you no, think so? It yes. could be this century. Yes. Yes. Sure. Um, okay, let's go on to the next one here. That's, you're shocked. That's, I, am I? Am I well, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I just, I just, um, my middle son just had a, and his wife had a baby, and mm -hmm. I was there holding this tiny little thing thinking that if this child lives a, a typical life that yeah. we could now predict, he will see the year 2100 and beyond. Yeah. And what will he see mm -hmm. in 2072 or 2082 or 2092? Mm -hmm. It's really, I, I hope we're here to see it. Yeah. Sometimes I worry about that too. Yes, that's but, a worry. But that's, I agree. that's, that's, that's us. Uh, somebody asks, is there a website where we can listen to the sun 24-7? Oh, uh, yeah, the, you can go to my website and yeah, you can have the sound files. Uh, uh, so do you, have yeah. the, you have the sound files on your on your website? The sound files are accessible. And yes. what is your website? Do you want to share that? Uh, if you Google Connie Arts, you will get there. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to come back to a couple of other questions somebody's got here because they're great. Um, how old is your star? Oh, my, well, <laughs> my star is about uh, 10 million years. It's, uh, it's a big blue star, I you know, and so it, it won't uh, last uh, much longer, and then it will explode and, uh, as a supernova and will create a neutron star. And so thanks to the, si the, the star quakes, the seismology, we more or less can predict how long that will still take before it reaches that state. So a couple of more million years. <laughs> just a couple more. Years. Okay. Yeah. I, there are a lot of questions here. There's one that just really struck me yeah. where somebody says, what advice does Astro Mama have for how we increase diversity in STEM? Oh, that's a very good, uh, important question. I work on it on a daily basis. It's all about role models, right? So you need to do bottom-up inclusion and welcome people of different color, different style, different gender, and make them work together. And that doesn't come by itself, but I, I'm, I really find it important to make sure that we have this diversity on the work floor in the group. And how are you doing with your groups? Yeah, I'm, I'm specifically hunting uh, women. Uh, people of color, because that's the only way to get there. We need actions to do that. Uh, so, so where do you go? How do you find everywhere? People? How do you everywhere? Are Literally there particular everywhere. challenges to getting people to yes. dedicate their lives. To yes, this? yes. Especially if they don't have models from within their community. Exactly. So it it does take action, and I welcome them. I uh, literally, you know, make sure that if I have job applications that I interview a mixed bag of uh, applicants and it really uh, needs uh, an orchestration to get diversity on the work floor. But I cannot just have my own male wild, uh, white team that wouldn't fit for me. Does, right? does the university, does academia, is it where it needs to be? to encourage and embrace this kind of diversity. Yes, stuff. but it's a daily struggle. And I, I get upset if uh, universities are not cooperative on improving it. So I'm an advocate of diversity, as we say in French. <laughs> OK, right. good. Let's come back to the star for a minute, because there's some more technical questions people have. How sharp are the boundary layers within the star? Uh -huh. And how large a variation is there in the rotation speed between the layers? Oh, yes. Very good question. So we have all sorts of answers to that question. So the, the, my most popular stars are fast rotators. And then the stars aren't even spherical. They are flattened. Huh? Because if you rotate very fast, you get more like an, a, a spheroid, as we say. And so we have stars where the 
the the inner rotation and the outer rotation uh, differ by a factor 100 and for some stars it differs almost nothing and so our theories cannot explain that very well right now um, so we have to work on the theory as i was saying like the data are way ahead of the theory for the moment and this impacts on how we do astrophysics because basically all topics in astrophysics rely on stellar computer models right Right. And we know that these models can be wrong by like two or three orders of magnitude in the rotational uh, speed. And so what we hadn't anticipated was that there's a big diversity among how stellar layers rotate. Mm -hmm. That's bigger than we had thought it was, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that must mean that there are phenomena that are not yet in the computer models that we have to put in there. And this is, of course, a longer term work to right. get to and another that. thing i would imagine that ai is going to be very helpful with right yes that's uh, evidently so but also basic you know fundamental laws of physics are really what we have to tune right um we just have a few minutes left here's one last one that i'd like to bring from the audience and then a couple of closing thoughts from you uh, connie do you think there would be an exact replica of planet earth looking at all the changes faced by the universe at the cosmic level yeah, well, I think it's difficult to avoid. Again, there are billions of uh, planets in our galaxy alone, and there are billions of galaxies. So, you know, there's all, only so much diversity you can have, I think. But it's a matter of stability of like, you no, know, we are on a planet around a quiet star. We have a moon that protected us from, you know, all sorts of garbage that would fall on our planet etc and we have a stable rotation axis of our planet so there are many parameters in the equation but i think it's almost unavoidable to have copies sitting out there and waiting almost to be discovered yeah that, well that would be something yeah. for my grandson to look yes. forward to yes maybe yes. <laughs> maybe yes so before we before we wrap up, this has been just totally fascinating. You know, you've 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 taken these star quakes and you've brought them to us and made them relevant and tied mm -hmm. them into our to our universe and to the search for extraterrestrial life and all the rest. What are you working on now? What are your immediate projects? What are you most focused on? Yeah. And what's next? Uh, my pet stars are really very fast rotators, and so stars that are no longer spheres but flattened. And I just have the privilege to have a really big grant from the European Research Council to spend the next six years trying to figure out how they work. And now that seems easy, but it's not because if you, you know, we treat stars as spheres, but rapid rotators are not spheres. And so then you have to go from something that is symmetric, a ball, to something that is flattened. And the mathematics of that is just horrendously more difficult. But that's what I'm going to be What's working going on. on inside that star? Yeah. And so uh, we're going to figure it out. We have five years and 10 million euros to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and how many and how many on your team are contributing to that? Uh, we uh, it's four teams. Uh, four teams, one in the US, two in France, and then my own team in Leuven. And we're going to work with about 20 people to solve that problem. And then give give all these better models to astrophysicists because as i was saying anybody in astrophysics uses stellar models and our models assume stars to be spheres and the ra rapid rotating stars are not spheres we can see that even in images so we have to fix this we have to bring a stable foundation to what i call the house of astrophysics and so that's the project that's what i'm going to be having fun with and will plato be a driver of that uh, it's going to help because it also has a, an open science uh, uh, program it's not only going to hunt for copies of the sun and copies of the earth but also there's eight percent of the plato time open to the taxpayers please apply for <laughs> plato time anybody uh, including uh, non non esa member states yes. I, I i have an opportunity every year to work with uh triple as and aau on uh -huh what's called the Golden Goose Awards. Some of you may have heard of the Golden Goose Awards. This is federally funded research that leads to curiosity driven, mm -hmm. serendipitous discovery yeah. that can translate mm -hmm. immeasurably to humanity and beyond. What do you think should be the priorities and the, and the, and the areas that most you know, get the funding at this stage? Oh, get the funding? The most inspiring applicants. 
really. And I don't want to pinpoint a topic. You know, of course, there are my pet topics. <laughs> but what I find really important is that uh, inspirational applicants can write beautiful proposals that are convincing to a committee. And that's very important for me. So in, that brings me back to science communication, because also within our field, some are much better than others to, to convey the message of their, of their passion, what they want to do. And so uh, let's uh, award that. I want to close, uh, Connie, by asking you something that um, Cynthia Friend mentioned early on, this mm -hmm. young scientist from Ukraine. Yes. You have taken under your wing and sponsored uh -huh. and supported. Yeah. What is his story? Why have you done this? What, um, well, he's, what can we learn from Yeah, so, so Mikita is, uh, is an Ukrainian who came and studied one year in Leuven, and while he was studying, the war broke out. And all of a sudden, his plan for life went down the drain, you know? This is tough. And so he was very inspirational because he was following his passion, and all of a sudden, a war came in between. So I found it very important as my personal humanitarian action to at least for one Ukrainian young, brilliant guy make the difference in his life. Well, clearly, so, what's he doing? He's now doing a pre-doctoral study in artificial intelligence to be applied to Plato and test data. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Kavli Foundation, for that. Thank you really? for making yeah. that incredible humanitarian gesture, investment, and, and piece of science. Um, this has been an incredible conversation. You, you are a star, um, and I'm sure you've heard that before. But, uh, but we really appreciate it, and thank you for advancing humanity in our understanding of the universe. Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you for having me. Eric, I'll turn it over to you. So, so let me start by thanking our audience. This was terrific questions, really engaged. We had almost 200 here and more than 300 on the online tonight. So thank you all. This is one of our biggest, for, for good reason, one of our biggest sessions that we've had. Um, I also want to thank, um, I, I want to I thank Connie for a couple things. One is your commitment to the science. I mean, it's, it's wonderful how committed you are to really important science. But also thank you for your commitment to early career scientists, because mm -hmm. I think you know, it, you know, I've always said I was I was up on the hill today, and I always talk about astronomy as the gateway to more science. So I really appreciate that your commitment to diversity and is just mm -hmm. it's so important. And astronomy in particular, I think, could use the help. Uh, chemistry and biology maybe not as much, but really, really in all fields. But astronomy is really important. Yeah. So thank you for that. Really appreciate what you're doing. And Frank, for just a wonderful, you know, wonderful interview, you brought out Connie's best side. I'm sure it's always the best side, but <laughs> but you're really able to bring out the science, but also who Connie Ferris is. So thank you both for that. I want to say one one more thing, which is when you say get the money, that was something that I, today I spent the whole day on the hill, mm -hmm. lobby not lobbying, advocating for a giant telescope, one of the giant Magellan telescopes, which is the next generation of Earth -based telescopes. So I can appreciate the comment, get the money, and I can appreciate all the beautiful astronomy that you're doing. I will use it in some of my stories. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So again, thank you all. Thank Cavali again. Thank the Norwegian Embassy. Thank the Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters for their support. I will ask you to keep your eye on, on mail from us because uh, in May 2024, we're going to have our next Cavali Joint Cavali Carnegie Lecture. Um, it's going to be a hard act to follow. That's all I can say. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye.